The best fried chicken in Texas. Rody's Country Fried Chicken. Texas born, Texas raised. A chicken joint with 35 years of service to our community. Thanks to our loyal customers and social media followers. Come try the best gizzards in Texas, the best tenders in Texas, and the best chicken in Texas. Call us at 830-773-9189. 830-773-9189. Don't forget, we have curbside service and delivery by DoorDash. Or find us on Facebook, Rodie's Chicken. R-O-D-E-E-S Chicken. Like us on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. The best fried chicken in Texas. Rodie's Country, Country Fried, fried Chicken. chicken. What is going on, guys? Uh, another episode of That Metal Interview podcast with myself, James, right from the heart of Texas. And uh, speaking this week, we have guitar great Brandon Ellis, guitarist for the Black Dahlia Murder. Yes, guys, ladies and gentlemen, you guys heard correctly, the Black Dahlia Murder, the great badass band. Uh, and Black Dahlia Murder hails from detroit michigan and of course uh, there's a whole history behind the actual name black dahlia murder but we are not here to talk about the actual history of those murders uh that took place back a long time ago anyways uh, we are here to talk about brandon ellis guitar extraordinaire for the black dahlia murder who has been in the band for a couple of years now he has been a part of the Black Dahlia Murder since 2016, give or take. Uh, he's uh, recorded uh, Nightbringers um, and, of course, last year's uh, Verminous. All these are great records, man. If you guys haven't heard these records, you have to have to, have to check them out, man. They're awesome. It's some awesome shit. Uh, check out Verminous and uh, check out, uh, for that matter, just check out all of uh, the Black Dahlia Murder's uh, uh, discography, man, that's just incredible, incredible uh, riffs, incredible, incredible vocals, incredible everything, man. It's just a badass band all around. And uh, and right now we have uh, Mr. Brandon Ellis uh, that's going to talk to us about the band and a little bit from his past band, Arsis, who he was also a part of. And uh, briefly with uh, Cannabis Corpse, uh, it's a different band than Cannibal Corpse. This is Cannabis Corpse, which is just as badass as Cannibal. He talks a little bit uh, from uh, his time with Arsis and all that, and uh, his a uh, little bit of uh, information on his equipment and all that. And uh, so, uh, anyways, let's check out the interview with uh, Mr. Brandon Ellis, and here it is. Enjoy, guys. Big fans of uh, of all your work, of course. Uh, Black Dahlia Murder, Arsis, you know. So, congrats Thank on you. your congrats on your career so far, man. I appreciate that, man. Uh, latest album. Let's talk about. Uh, of Verminous, 10 Badass Tracks, uh, Metal Blade. Uh, can you talk to us about this album? Uh, who writes the riffs? Uh, how do you guys uh, arrange, you know? Sure, yeah. So um, generally we, uh, we take time off the road specifically to write an album. So we'll have a period where we won't book a tour and we'll be like, all right, we're going we're gonna to write an album now. And it's, it's go time, you know. There's kind of a deadline and it's like the pressure's on and that's kind of what, what kicks me into gear is um, having that, that really specific time period where it's like, now is the time to do this. Um, and so we all start writing. And so generally I um, I write complete songs by myself and Brian writes complete songs by himself, the other guitar player, um, where I'll, you know, it's we do it that way because we just have a, a lot of time to really um, iron out our ideas. Um, yeah, the songs on the album, either they started with me or they started with Brian generally um, riff wise so that you you get kind of two very different sides of Black yeah. Dahlia Murder that way um, and it, it makes for a, a diverse ride of an album I think this is crazy how uh, if you listen to other bands I mean in, in a fan's point of view and you listen to Black Dahlia and uh, it's just crazy music you know I mean uh, what do you guys listen to or what how, how do you guys come up with this stuff well, I guess it comes from everywhere, honestly. Um, it 
if I could tell you anything, like for me, it doesn't come from other bands that sound like us, really. Okay. Um, yeah. It's um, not that, you know, I guess I, I do get some inf- inspiration, like from At The Gates and, and stuff like that, and like my, my core style of yeah. riffing and, and what, you know, the, the aesthetic of the sound, but the actual like ideas of melodies and chords and um, the, the start of the songs themselves, they always come from some inspiration from like, some pop song I heard on the radio or some rock song or some 80s prog band or something like that. Maybe it's just a, a drum beat that I thought was cool and I'm like, oh, I'll just put that drum beat down and I'll try to come up with like a sick metal riff over it or something and there will be like some kind of inspiration from, from something that I've very recently heard and it's usually, I try to keep my inspiration as far from like, you know, being from melodic death metal band oh. as, as I can so that we can be doing something different, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be inspired by another band that sounds like us, because then I'm just going to water down their sound, you know what I mean? So yeah. in order to make it mine, I kind of take it from as far as I can. Well, it sounds great. You know, whatever you guys are doing, it sounds... What I meant by crazy is crazy, good crazy. <laughs> I mean, good good Thank music, you. good metal, you know, that's awesome stuff. Uh, so yeah, A lot of the ideas also kind of come from like a, I listen to a lot of classical music and I think Brian does too and like film score music stuff like that Oh wow. um, and you hear a lot of like really adventurous harmony and, and kind of uh, you know a lot of stuff that's kind of out of the realm of, of what you would expect in, um, in you know heavy metal and there's a lot of stuff that you hear on those sort of things where you get this really kind of you can find really evil menacing mean kind of sounds watching like a movie and um, yeah. that's the kind of stuff I keep my ear out for. And when I hear like a strange chord happen and like I'm watching a scary movie or something and this scene is particularly menacing, I pay really close attention to the score and I'll like get out my guitar and I'll try to figure out what, what chord that is and how I can kind of throw that into a song. Like for specifically on Verminous, I think there's a lot of stuff on there that I would say was like directly inspired by the Hellraiser scores for me. Oh, wow. Really? Wow, that's so a- that's just uh you know it's just um having having like a really broad eclectic background of, of things I think is kind of where where I get my sound from. That's cool. That's a cool formula. Cool. Uh, it's the first time I hear that. Uh, being inspired by you know uh, horror films or whatever. That's cool. Yeah, most uh, definitely. So let's go back in time, if if you will. Uh, at what age did you start uh, playing guitar? I believe I was eleven years old. I think I was in sixth grade. Sixth grade. Okay. Cool. What what was your uh, what bands did you listen to, or what? What's the first uh, song you learned? Um, I think the first song I learned was like "Smoke on the Water," like pretty much everybody else. Um, I was into like classic rock stuff at the time, you know, like AC/DC and Led Zeppelin, and that was kind of like the first stuff that I like ever really tried to learn on a, on an electric guitar. So, um, you know, I was I was hearing the music that my parents were showing me, and I was stoked about it, and I wanted to do that, you know. So. Like uh, Van Halen, ACDC, and you know all that that kind of yeah stuff that you uh, you know household stuff. Yeah, classic rock. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, so where uh, how did you land the 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 gig with Black Dahlia? If, if I may ask. Well, I kind of landed every gig that I got from like the last gig that I had. It's kind of the way my career's gone. So I, I got the gig in Black Dahlia because I was friends with Ryan, the guitar player uh-huh. um, who played previously. And um, the reason I was friends with Ryan was because I was playing with Arsis and he was kind of, you know, keeping tabs on them and, and he was buds with everybody and he reached out to me and was like, hey man, I think you're awesome. And um, he was, he, we kept in touch and we chatted and I'd come out to Black Dahlia shows to, to hang out with him once in a while, you know, when they were in town. And, and um, yeah, he like, he showed an interest in me, I guess I could say. I was very young, you know, I was like 19 or something when I, when I started playing with Arsis and I, I guess he kept his eye on me to, to kind of, you know, years later when he was uh, trying to move on to the next, you know, stage of his life that uh, I guess he had me in mind. Cool. Uh, changing uh, uh, subjects a bit, uh, where did you guys film the, the, the Yule Mall stream? Where what was that at? Well, we, um, we got together in Michigan where the band is from. Um, I say that because a lot of us are kind of spread out across the U.S., so I, I live in New Jersey, actually. Okay. But um, we all get together in Michigan, and we actually filmed Yule Mall in four different locations. Okay. Um, just to keep the backdrops interesting and kind of have like a, you know, we're trying to make like a variety hour kind of show. And so we didn't want to be like in some in the same location the whole time or have it be like cliche or anything like that. So um, one set we did in, in Brian, the other guitar player, um, we did it in his, 
I guess I could say, I could say attic, but it's not really, you know, it's a finished, it's, it's like the upper level of this house is like a jam space where we practice. Okay. Um, we've got all our amps and a drum kit set up there and stuff. And so uh, we filmed the first set there and that was nice to do the first set there because, you know, we had all, all the time that we needed to, to set up and figure out how we were going to actually do this. And, um, you know, it took, a, it was a lot because we had all this like Christmas decorations and stuff. We had a soundboard to set up. We had monitors. It was like setting up a, a concert a video shoot, a recording session, and like a Christmas celebration <laughs> for for just for each location. So it was like we had to do that, and then we filmed four songs there, and then it was like, all right, let's do it again, but we're gonna drive to this farm, and it was a farm that was like oh. maybe 40 minutes, 40 minutes out of town, and we would get there and we would set up all that stuff again, and it would take like eight hours of setup, you know, before we could even like start doing it, and then we did another four songs, and we kind of repeated that process two more times in these four different places that were just like you know wherever we could find to play loud and yeah get away with it at that time you know cool cool video uh or videos so how about the the, the video for necropolis uh i saw the bowling alley and all that uh, where was that at also uh that's before my time in the band but that's actually um yeah. a, a famous bowling out i think it's uh it's a, it's a called the Majestic Theater is um, the venue and there's a bowling alley attached to it. Um, okay. I, I guess it's, maybe it's called the Majestic Bowl. I, I actually can't remember. And then there's another venue upstairs called the Magic Stick. And we usually will, or we often have played um, a, a Christmas concert that they do there called Black Christmas, where they get at least metal and hardcore bands and stuff like that. And they they do a show there. So it's kind of like a staple in the Detroit live music scene. And it's also like a historical building. It's very old and. So yeah, it's a really cool location, and it's you know it's it's tied in with the history of the Black Dahlia murder, I guess. Right. So how is it working with the uh, the guys from Black Dahlia, as compared to uh, Arsis? What's the difference there? In oh man, it's it's amazing, honestly. It's I'm I'm so grateful for these guys and and how they treat me. I've I've never honestly never felt like so respected in my life, and working with these guys, it's it's wild how good they are to me. Um, you know, and and I love playing with Arsis too. Arsis is, is was great, and I actually kind of got my start in touring with uh -huh. Arsis, and I'm eternally grateful to those guys too. Um, so when I started playing with Arsis, I was like a fill-in. Um, I was filling in for the front man actually, but we had a we had a fill-in singer and a fill-in guitar player because James he does both, and so I did the you know I was the guitar part of filling in for James, and another guy was the the vocal part, okay. and um, you know eventually. We were uh, making a new album, and they asked me if I wanted to play some solos on it, and I did. And then they asked me if I joined the band, and so on. And uh, over the years, you know, we we worked together a lot. We wrote some music and stuff, and um, it was a similar process, I guess, to, to how I described Black Dahlia will write yeah. music. But um, in the end, Arsis is is really James Malone's baby. It's his band, and everybody knows it, and everybody wants it that way. And I'm not saying that like he's like any kind of control freak or anything like that he's yeah. a super nice guy he's actually he wants he wants to get everybody as involved as, as possible and he's very welcoming um but it's kind of the fan response is like very focused on on james in particular um and so i, I felt kind of like a side man in uh in, in arsis i if i'm telling the truth yeah um but um it was you know it was a, it was a great experience playing in arsis but um as a a band it was kind of a we didn't play, we didn't tour nearly as much as Black Dahlia Murder does, and we don't record albums nearly as, as much as Black Dahlia Murder does, so it was much, it was more of like a part-time kind of thing um, oh, okay. for everybody in, in the band, really. Um, so it's totally different to be in a band that's like, you know, we're on, we're, you know, pandemic aside, we're on the road like maybe eight months of the year, maybe three quarters of the year, um, and we we're writing an album like every two years, and there's just a lot more going on constantly. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, aside from that, I guess that's that's really the the main difference is that we're just we are um, you know a lot more active than I'd, I'd I'd ever really been before. Yeah. So you recorded. Uh, let me get this straight. Uh, two albums and one EP with uh, Arsis. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Is that correct? So what comes to mind? Uh, you know, for example, with uh, Unwelcome, you know, Celebration of Guilt. What comes to mind when you hear those albums? Man, A Celebration of Guilt to me is like a timeless classic. That album has been so influential to me in my, my writing and just, I mean, every aspect of it from like 
you know, the the drumming to the riffing and the soloing and, and the like kind of this, the guitar sound and everything. Everything about that album is like really cool to me and really genuine. And it's kind of like, you know, it's from 2004, I believe. But it's kind of one of the last albums before metal got like super polished and stuff like that. And it's actually like a very raw album. Um, and I really appreciate that about it. And like, kind of, it has kind of that old school quality of, of being like, a, you know, it really sounds like a, a band jamming in a in a room. You know, um, it's not so like mechanically perfect and stuff like that. It's got a lot of attitude and a lot of spirit to it. And I'm I'm always kind of keeping that in mind. And every now and then I, I go and I play that album and I'm like, yeah, okay, this is like a, it's a good thing to remind myself, like, this is what this sounds like. And, you know, I, I like this and I feel like a lot of these albums coming out now are kind of missing something special that this, this record has. That's kind of how I feel about a celebration of guilt. Um, Unwelcome. Yeah, that was an interesting one. It's, it's actually for me, I wasn't in the band yet when the album was written. Okay. And um, when it was recorded, they were, that's when I was talking about, they were asking me to do guest solos. Okay. So I, I think I played like four solos on that album. Um, and okay. that was really my contribution there. And, you know, I, I did the, the touring on it. And there was that Leper's Caress EP uh-huh. that we did with Scion. That actually, um, if I remember right, it came out before Unwelcome did, but it was actually recorded after Unwelcome was. Oh, really? Logic. Oh wow! Um, so for Leper's Caress, I was actually in the band, and I actually play more on that than I than I did on Unwelcome. Um, okay. So yeah, um, and then um, Visitant, we're definitely much more of like a. It's like five years down the road, and we're like much more a, a real band together. You know, okay. um, we played like a million shows, like good ones and bad ones, and had great times and bad times together and stuff like that. And we've really got like a connection going on Visitant, and. Um, I really think that that album is is awesome for sure. I'm really proud of of what we did there, definitely. Oh yeah, it's some awesome metal. So great job, uh, and uh, if any of the artists guys are listening, you know, uh, a big shout out and uh, great music, man. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. James is definitely has a very very distinct sound of of writing music and writing metal, and you know, the the, the metal landscape would be missing something without him. So right, yeah, for sure. For sure. Now, uh, talk to us about uh, the Jackson Pro Series Signature Kelly, and uh, how long have you been working with uh, Jackson Guitars? Man, uh, so Jackson kind of approached me, I think it was uh, it was right around the time that Nightbringers came out, so I guess like 2017, um, maybe 2018, maybe it was, like, it was like a little bit after, I actually can't remember exactly when it was, okay. um, but yeah, they kind of um, got in contact with me. And they were like, oh, do you have a guitar endorsement? Would you be interested in endorsing Jackson? Like, we think that you would be a, a good fit on our roster, and, and we'd like to work with you, essentially. Yeah. Um, and in my career at this point, I've been kind of cultivating this thing. I've been playing, like, these old, obscure, kind of rare guitars that, like, nobody else was playing oh, really? for a long time. So that I could kind of, like, I could see people buying these guitars and, and them, like, gaining value in the used market. And I could see people, like, you know, people being influenced by me. And so I kind of did this on purpose so that I could prove that I had the ability to kind of market a product and wait for companies to notice and come to me. Because in, in the endorsement world, you're really, uh, you're, you don't want to be the guy who's, like, trying to convince some company that you're cool enough. You know, you don't want to yeah. be messaging them. And being like, oh, I, I think that you guys should endorse me because I'm in this band and we sell this many albums and we <laughs> tour this much, or whatever. Like, that's totally the yeah. wrong way to, to go about it. So I kind of, I, I didn't have a guitar endorsement for a long time. I just played the guitars I liked, and um, they became kind of, you know, popular in a way. And, and people were starting to use the stuff I was using, and I, and I guess that they noticed. And so, yeah, they asked me if I wanted to work with them, and I was like, yeah, sure. I've got a lot of cool guitars, a lot of cool Jacksons. You know, I've, I've got a big collection of guitars, and I, I really love Jackson guitars. They're they're my favorite, actually. I've kind of waiting for years for hoping that they would contact me one day, and, and finally they did. So I was like, yeah, I'd love to work with you guys. It, it would I would really it would really seal the deal for me if I could order like a custom shop guitar, because I have all these old guitars that are really cool and really unique, and I want to continue playing guitars that are unique and and you know. Um, so I would like to order something like that. And they were like, sure, what do you want? And um, I ordered my green crackle Kelly. Yeah. And, you know, it takes it takes a year or two to, to get a guitar made when you order a custom shop. 
So they were like, okay, we'll do that. You'll, you know, you'll have it in a year or so. And um, in the meantime, would you like to play this the Snakeskin Kelly that we have? That's kind of has a similar amount of similar specs to the guitar that you just ordered. And I was like, hell yeah, that's exactly my speed, you know. So they sent me this guitar right away, you know. And like a week later, I had this guitar, and that's when I started playing Jackson officially. Was was when I was playing that. Um, so a year down the road, I get this Green Crackle Kelly, and it's it's amazing. It's awesome. It's like the the inlays glow in the dark, and it's a really one of a kind guitar, you know. And I'm showing it off as much as I can, and people are like, "I want that guitar. How can I buy that guitar?" Etc. Yeah. And they're bothering Jackson about it and stuff. And and so again, I, I get this email out of the blue from Jackson, and they're like, uh, "You know, we want to make this a production model, and here's like a." Um, they sent me like a proposal about it, um, and it was all kind of laid out for me. And I was all I all, all I had to do was kind of iron out the specs and and sign on the dotted line, you know. And that was really awesome. Um, I wasn't expecting it at all. I kind of feel like I got to like cut a line or something like that, you know. Like I, I came in pretty new, and um, now I've got this signature guitar, and, and I I really can't believe it. It's really really awesome. It's a badass design. I love that look, cracks and all that. It's very cool. You. Yeah, it's yeah. you know it's retro, but it's also it's it keeps up with you know the modern metal appearance. It's very much you know a timelessly like cheesy, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh it'll never get old. You know what I mean? To me, anyways, it'll it'll always be a thing. Um, and it's kind of uh, it's kind of waned and come back, and so the crackle is uh, it's a good time to be to be having a crackle guitar. Um. And uh, as, as far as I can tell, the you know people are buying these things. It's it's going really good. It's still pre-order stage so far. Awesome. Um, so uh, nobody has actually gotten them yet. Yeah. Um, but I you know I have my my prototype, and it's an awesome guitar, and I'm I'm super excited for people to start getting them and to start seeing that. It's really uh, it's really incredible to me. Awesome. Uh, so here's a different question. Um, give us your best gig and uh, your worst gig. Oh man. All right. So. Um, Let's say a, a best gig, one that always comes to mind like immediately is is Rock Al Parque, which is a, a Colombian okay. festival. Uh -huh. It's sponsored by the government and it's free for everybody. Um, okay. So there's like, I, I think there were like 110,000 people or something like that wow. when we played. It was wild. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't see the end of the people. It was this huge sea, and they got so small they just like turned into a blur. <laughs> there were just like four layers of jumbotrons going going down this field, and it was nuts. Uh, we played at prime time. We played at like 10 p.m. and we played for like I think it was a 90 minute set or or like 75 minute set, like a full length headlining set. Um, I think the band that played after us was Sepultura. Wow. And um, so we had like a really good spot there. You know, we didn't like play in the afternoon for like 30 minutes or something, yeah. like you do a lot of times at like a big festival or whatever. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, it was just like a zillion people, man. And it's interesting because there's no alcohol. It's like just because the government's running it and they want to, you know, keep it orderly and whatever. So you're playing to like this massive crowd of sober people. Um, and it's it's a it's a, it's a one of a kind experience. And the whole city of Bogota is kind of like overrun by this festival um, while it's going on. And that was definitely a surreal thing. And um, it happened pretty early when I joined Black Dolly, actually. It was like within the first year that I joined Black Dolly, we did this like crazy festival. It was the biggest the biggest crowd the band's ever played to. Wow. Um, so what uh, what's next for Brandon, for yourself? What, what can fans expect next? Well, next is, uh, is Black Dolly Murder is going to hit the road again. Um, awesome. They're telling me that we're going to be out in the, in the fall at some point on a tour in the United States. And um, I'm supposed to believe that that's really going to happen. So, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm hopeful. I believe it. And um, that's that's step one. You know, um, it's going to be a different landscape. It's going to be like totally, totally different now. Going back out there after this this whole pandemic for yeah. this long, um, we've really just been kind of waiting because we came out with this album Verminous right when everything shut down. Yeah. And a lot of bands are like, we're going to write a new album in, the, in this break and whatever. And we're like, man, we put a lot into this album. We didn't get to play it for anybody, really. That's true. Yeah. We played two songs in South Africa at two shows. And that was the day that like the world kind of like locked down. It was like right after, the day after that. We were like flying home and it was like crazy and everything was closed down. Um, and these, you know, we believe in this album and we believe in these songs and we don't want to just skip to the next one. We want to go out there and play all these songs for people. So. We aren't like cranking out a new album to come out with and, and get back on the road with something new. We're like, yeah, we, we want to show you Verminous and 
Yeah. And um, with these songs were made to be played live. Like I put a lot of effort into these songs being um, being good for that that situation, like predominantly. And um, I can't wait to see to see the, you know the crowd response and the reaction. And hear you know meet all the people after the shows and have them tell me about how the album kind of helped them through this. You know, yeah. crazy time in everybody's life and, and whatever. So uh, I think it. I think this album deserves that. You know. So we're all just kind of waiting to get to play Verminus. I think. Well, us fans are waiting too. So hopefully, you know, things work out. So. Uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna happen. Uh, so we've, before we let you go, uh, would you like to send a message to to the fans listening to this podcast? Yeah, anybody listening to this podcast, man, I commend you. Thank you for for checking out um, J Rock's Metal Zone and for checking me out and following up with what I'm doing and um. You know, I actually, I really don't do a whole lot of interviews. Um, rather, this, you know, when, when we're on tour and we're playing shows and stuff, the interviewers, uh, they always want to talk to the vocalist or the founders of the band or whatever, and and um, and that's, of course they do, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't get a whole lot of requests, so it's, it's so thank you um, for asking me to do this. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about whatever you want to ask me about. And, um, yeah, I feel like I'm just kind of starting to get my chance to, show my fans sort of who I am in a, in a more personal way. So I'm, I'm really excited to have, you know, sat here talking with you and I'm really excited uh-huh. for everybody who's listening and, and grateful for them to take the time to do that. And, um, yeah, be on the lookout for a new tour announcement. And if you're not familiar, the Black Dahlia Murder Verminous, it's been out for a while now. It's a, uh, it's full of heavy headbanger riffs and it's actually kind of themed in, uh, in, in modern times of what's going on and, uh, it's a very cool album, and and don't don't sleep on it. So yeah, thank you very much for um, for all the support. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you for uh, uh, bringing uh, such great music to us uh, metal fans, and and uh, your ta- uh, talent yourself. You should be doing more interviews, and uh, hope to see you guys on the road soon. You know. Yeah, yeah. It seems it seems to be picking up, and I'm I'm really excited to sort of get back to you know doing my job. I'm excited about it. And actually, uh, real quick, uh, three days from now, April 17th is the one-year anniversary of Verminous. I don't know if you knew that. Wow. No, yeah. I did not realize that. It's That's wild, man. Yeah, I was looking through the dates, and yeah, so cool. Thank you, Brendan. All right, awesome. Sounds good. Much obliged, and what an honor to speak to such a shredder on the guitar, Mr. Ellis, Brandon Ellis of the Black Dahlia Murder. And uh, we hope you guys enjoyed that, man. So uh, stay tuned for other other interviews uh, coming up. We got uh, Terry Butler of Obituary and Inhuman Condition, of course. And you know Mr. Butler has been, uh, he's a legend on the bass. Uh, he was there from the inception of death metal with Massacre. And uh, Mr. Chuck Schuldner, may he rest in peace, death six feet under and now obituary so mr butler the legend will be with us on this next episode and amongst other other badass guests that i'm not going to reveal right now so anyways uh, we thank you guys for joining us and uh keeping the the flag going the metal flag if you will and uh don't forget to support the black dollar murder uh support arsis and all of brandon ellis's projects and bands if you will um you guys know where to find those guys uh online and this and that so and don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel ring the bell uh thank you for supporting us on social media we're still working on getting on tiktok and we're gonna get on there very very soon so but you can find us anywhere else uh you know j rocks metal zone our our radio show and of course our podcast that metal interview podcast and don't forget to keep it metal That middle interview.